Hi again, everyone. Checking in again on chapter 31 of Shelmer Dean's Introduction to Greek, and we're talking about the perfect system. Last time I drew, this was like the fourth XY axis chart that I drew, but we were explaining the aspect of the perfect, this completed action in the past with present relevance. I'm not going to rehash that. You can look in the last video. Let's go to how we would actually go about forming this. So like the aorist, there are weak and strong forms of the perfect. In this chapter, we're only going to be talking about the weak forms. Weak is a pejorative term, right? That sounds bad. We'd like to think strong. But uh, we might also think, and this is not what the term that linguists would use, it's kind of a, it's incorrect at a certain level, but this is the regular or common form of the, of the verb. Uh, you know, we, we have the same thing in English, right? We have strong verbs like uh, to say, I sang, I'm singing, and if I try to put that in the past, I sing, I sang, we don't say, I singed, right? That would be regular. That would be weak. So sang is a strong form, um, whereas a weak form in English is something like walk, turning into walked. So if you kind of think about different verbs in English, a lot of the common ones that we use often are strong. But just the majority of them, if you're looking in the dictionary, uh, they're going to be weak. The same thing happens in Greek. Uh, so when we're talking about the weak perfect forms, uh, don't think of that as a bad thing. Think of that as the, uh, the more common thing. Uh, so we're going to use our, our, kind of our, our basic verb that we've been using the entire time, luo. So now if you remember, uh, if you've been a good Greek student this whole time, we've got six principal parts. Luo, luso, to make it future, right? then elusa, that weak aorist with the past indicative augment. And then if you've been following along, you've seen there's a fourth principal part, leluka. So what can we tell just by the fact that the accent falls on the epsilon here? How can it be on the anti-penult, the, the three, two, one, you know, two syllables back? Well, that can only happen if that alpha is short. So uh, Shelmerdine prints it as short, but that's, that's a way that even if she didn't print, you could know that has to be short because that's get, receiving the accent there. That's our perfect active form. We're going to get to the fifth principal part and the, uh, act, uh, the middle and passive forms of the perfect in the next lesson, uh, in chapter 32, that is. Uh, but for right now, let's just stop at number four. We don't even need to think about the air as passive number six. This is the principal part. We're finally getting to it. Um, so let's, let's talk about then what that's going to look like. So we had leluka, and remember that the principal parts are always giving you the first person singular. Luo, I loosen, I will loosen, I loosened, I have loosened. And that's how we want to translate these. So I have loosened. And then, um, that's a short alpha, as I was saying. The ending here is really just the short alpha. Uh, and this is a chart on page 214. Um, it's available for you, but you know we're just kind of going through it quickly here. Uh, Lelukas is the second. So note that this is looking a lot like the aorist so far. Short alphas followed by sigmas on top of these, but what we don't have is an augment because this is a primary verb. This is really present tense, but just perfect in aspect. And then our third person, again, just like the aorist, leluke. So the nice thing here is that you're not learning different endings so far. We're just adding the aorist endings onto the uh, present tense. So I should, there's a new movable there, just like the aorist. So that's terrible handwriting. Let me try to repair that a little bit. Great. All right, so first person plural, we're going to, again, just like the aorist. So, le luke, amen. Why did that accent have to move off the initial epsilon? Well, because we can only go three back. Verb accents recessive, but there's a limit to the recession. That's as far as it can go. So again, amen will be our ending. Um, second person plural, you all, le lukate. Got ahead of myself. Le lukate. So again, ate is the ending. Now, this is where we are going to differ from the aorist. Le luc asi. That's a long alpha, and then again there's a new movable. What's going on here? Well, a few things. What would the aorist third person plural ending be? Hopefully you remember that's an alpha nu, on. 
Well, that's a secondary ending. We've seen that over and over again now. This is a primary ending. It's, a, it's got a different thematic vowel here, but if you were to think of the present or the future ending in usi, or the subjunctive ending in oc, all with a new movable, this is just the uh, kind of alpha form of all of that. Lelukasi, slash lelukase. So let's uh, go back to the translations. I have loosened, you have loosened. He, she, it has loosened. So these are active, perfect translations in English. So have, have, has, this is, so we have a perfect participle in English, loosened, that we're combining with the form of the verb to have. I have loosened, you have loosened, he has, we have loosened, y'all have loosened, they have loosened. So the rest are just going to be exactly the same um, as these. It's really the, the third singular in English is the irregular looking uh, form. Everything else is have. All right, so that's that's not too bad. Uh, I told uh, to briefly return to this third person plural. Um, this alpha is long, even though the rest of these alphas are short, out of something that we've encountered once or twice before called compensatory lengthening. In ancient languages, which are based on uh, accent and other things are based on vowel length, uh, what is sometimes called quantity, at an earlier form of the language, this was anti as an ending instead of asi. A sigma comes in here and takes over. So all of that gets removed and something that used to have two consonants following it, one of which was nasalized, you think anti, uh, some of that as blending into some of that n of the n sound. So that made it long. And then once the form of it, the phonetics changed, uh, that's reflected by this staying a long alpha. You don't have any nasalization necessarily. It's not ansi, it's just asi. But they, they hold on to a little bit of that extra length because they've lost that new ta that used to be there. It used to be a double syllable, now it's just a single. Uh, so that's nice to know. That, that's, that's fairly high-level comparative linguistics material uh, or historical kind of diachronic linguistics. Um, it's okay not to know or even care about these things right now. You're all interested in just reading texts. Uh, so, so don't worry about it, but know that behind everything in Greek, there's a method to the madness. And I'm not saying that the method isn't itself maddening, um, but there's always an explanation. Uh, and as you continue on in your progress in Greek and these things become second nature and you start to pay attention to these things, it's a really rewarding um, process to say, ah, this is what's going on. So now let's turn to the pluperfect and note that these are all going to be had blanked and in this case loosened because we're now re projecting this further in the past. Not only is it past action that's been completed, but its relevance is also completed. So that's why it's secondary. And because we're in the indicative, before we write anything else, we can start putting in those past indicative augments. Epsilon as always. All right, so what something I didn't point out here in the perfect is note what, I mean, I'm sure you all noticed it, we were getting the same thing that we got with some of the thematic verbs, right? Ditto me, uh, tithe me, and the, the one that I couldn't remember in the last lesson, his, sorry, <laughs> start over, histe me. And histe me is kind of hidden on what's happening there. But this is reduplication is what we call this, where we have a consonant and we repeat it kind of in a stutter. Now, histemi, you're saying what's going on there. Well, it used to be systemi, but these, this initial sigma in front of vowels often becomes aspirated, becomes a he. So histemi, it's hard to see, but really it is reflecting this reduplication. And tithemi, it used to be thithemi, uh, but as you just heard, that, that sounds a little awkward. Um, again, a kind of linguistic process called dissimilation here of aspirates of the theta was in effect. And they said, we don't want to go thithe, we want to go tithe. And, and also remember that the ancient theta is not how we pronounce it as a fricative, a th. It was more of a, a, a you know, a rough breathing ta, a t, as opposed to just t. So t is really what they're going. I'm not sure if my computer 
uh, a microphone can record any of that, but that's the concept behind this. So anyway, reduplication was the mark of the present in these athematic verbs, but in these thematic verbs, in these um, now what we're dealing perfect forms, perfects reduplicate. So that's why we're getting all of these lambdas at the beginning. Of course, that can get complicated when your verb actually begins with a vowel, right? How do you reduplicate that? We'll cover that in a future lesson. Uh, but now we can kind of keep building those parts. So let's let's put in the reduplication. I guess technically the re reduplication is just the lambda epsilon because after that we're going to kind of make Neapolitan um, verb forms here. Um, after that becomes the actual stem. So the, the, the real stem of Luo, we've known it from the very beginning, is lambda upsilon. Good, so we've got yellow past indicative augment, showing that this is a pluperfect, it's a secondary sequence. Le, just showing it's perfect in aspect, that's what the reduplication of, is about. And then last, we've got the stem, and then we also have you know, the kind of standard perfect consonant. And again, this is the weak perfect, which goes into a kappa. Uh, strong perfects will use other things. What is this similar to? Well, this is very similar to the theta in those six principal part forms, right? Most of the time it's a theta, but sometimes it'll be a phi, sometimes it'll be a beta, um, but standardly it's a theta. That's exactly the same process we have going on here. So these are all of our stems. All that we need now are secondary personal endings, and those are going to be kind of new in their form to you. So first is just an eta. And note, what length is eta? Always long, so the accent has to fall on the penult, the second to last syllable. Good, now second person, that's gonna be easy, ace. Just put a sigma on the end. Third person, this gets a little bit trickier, we get ain, and there's a kind of logic behind that. Know that etas are often coming from epsilons, they're lengthened forms, and here this is another kind of Epsilon plus epsilon can become epsilon iota. So while they look quite different, you know in Greek that they're pronounced about the same. Um, and that's why it's coming in here. Um, also, I should note, that's a new movable. So it might just be eleluke. Um, first person plural. This is actually a little bit simpler, but these will be new endings to us. We get a short epsilon here. We haven't seen that thematic vowel before a men before. This is brand new stuff. Uh, but we're going to have the same thing in the um, second person uh, plural, which is not surprising. We've seen that as the thematic vowel for the second person before. So, eleluquete. And then lastly, but not least, eleluc s or eh, and then our kind of standard ending san. And remember, this is a secondary ending. Asi or something similar that's what we'd expect in the primary. But because this is secondary, it's past tense, it's got the augment, this is our form. Um, so this is a little bit potentially of a pain because, um, I mean, just look at what we're up to, right? Um, this is a long word. The reduplication can get a little bit tiring, <laughs> uh, but especially with a nice lambda. These are actually kind of pleasant sounding verbs but they are long, they are complicated. Why? Well, a lot of reasons. They're secondary, we're setting them in the past. We're saying that they've got a special sort of aspect. We of course have to carry the essential nature of the verb, the loosening, the loo. Uh, we're giving it, a, kind of further marking it as perfect with not just the reduplication, but with this kind of weak consonant. And then our personal endings. Uh, so, as often we've seen in Greek, one word here, elelukete, means y'all, you all, plural, had loosened. So we're doing the same thing. You all, second person plural, had. Okay, well that's setting it in the past tense. That's somewhat akin to our epsilon augment here. Loosened, this thing taken together, we know that we use that for the pluperfect and that's basically taking care of the middle of this word. Uh, so they're messy, long words, but it's just the Greek's way of doing it in one word rather than doing it in three, or I mean really three and a half, because that's a contraction. 
Uh, so this is what we're looking at when we look at the perfect and pluperfect forms in their weak, and by that again, I mean more common forms. So to review this whole lesson, we're in chapter 31 of Shelmerdine. We're talking about the active form of the perfect system. So far, we've only looked at active endings. We'll get to passive just next. And all of these things for the perfect, we're really talking about aspect as much as we're talking about tense. And that the perfect is a primary kind of present tense where the pluperfect actually sets it in the past, which is what explains the fact that we have no augments in the um, simple perfect. We have, however, um, primary endings. Um, so this is what our perfect looks like. This is what our per blue perfect looks like. Very colorful. I think this is actually fairly useful to see what are the useful parts that we can see in breaking up any of these words to understand them because it's all encoded in there. You just need to have the decoder ring uh, to be able to figure out what the heck <laughs> Plato or Xenophon or Herodotus, whoever you're reading is writing. All right, see you next time.